We're going to start with a new song today. It's going to be Jeremiah 2.17. Jeremiah 2.17. I'll just read it through real quickly. Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. Um, Brother Warren, could you go ahead and open us with prayer? Okay, Jeremiah 2.17. I hope there's enough copies for everyone. Let's do that one more time. That's a new one for us, but I think it's a really beautiful song. Jeremiah 2.17, we'll do it one more time. Then we'll go to 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20. For most of us, let's do it one more time as well. 
Because I, I heard it was very quiet. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20. Let's try it one more time. Now then we are ambassadors, ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ and be ye reconciled to God. Be ye reconciled to God. Now That was a little bit better. Hebrews 7, 25. And just remember, I know we're thinking about it, but let's pay attention to the verses as well. Hebrews 7, verse 25. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost. Let's go to Matthew 16. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 16. And good morning. We have, we have a very large number of people uh, sick and out today. So good morning to all the families at home. And I am glad that you are not sick and that you are here and looking forward to spending some good time together with the Lord uh, this morning. And let's just, let's have another word of prayer before we begin. Father, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you, Lord, for your unbelievable mercies, your grace. And we thank you, God, that we can come this morning together as a church family with a Bible and that we are not subject today to um, whims, opinions, culture. Lord, that our subjection is to your perfect word. And I want to thank you for that. And I would just pray and ask, Lord, this morning that as we open the word, study it, and contemplate the church, the ministry, and what you have for us, that our hearts would be open and attentive to you today. You are a wonderful God and so worthy, Lord, to be worshipped and adored and praised. God, we pray for the many uh, families, individuals that are sick today. Um, and I'm, I'm grateful, Lord, that we have technology for them to join with us. And I do pray for a quick hand of healing, Lord. Um, we also want to lift up um, those who are traveling, uh, Episcopos that are off to North Dakota, the Coles that are still in the Midwest. Uh, just keep them, those families safe as they uh, travel uh, this morning, the Lowe's as they make their way on to Florida, and we just pray, Lord, for <clears throat> your mercies as those that are on the road, and um, we just, this morning, Lord, want to say that we love you. Please speak to our hearts and teach us, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we have truly had a very eventful six or eight weeks as a church. We have scattered everywhere. 
Um, we have been to, uh, earlier this year, to Zambia. We have been to um, Mexico. We have been to Alaska. We have been to Misery. It is how you pronounce it, I promise you. That is how you pronounce that um, state. Um, I want to know how many people who went to Missouri on the mission training are still scratching a few spots. Is it gone? No more itches? I have, I have a few tick spots on my legs that are still uh, bugging me. It's been a wonderful and tremendous um, time. And I think for those who have traveled and those who have stayed, part of the Part of my hope and prayer is that God continues to make us aware of why it is we exist as a church. Like, what's the reason for the church? And, and there are more than one reason for it. Or I should say there's more than one function of the church. Um, I hope as a believer that you feel helped by the church that the church is a place that we as believers, we're not being evangelized, we're already evangelized, we come into the church body and that we are ministered to. It's a place that we grow, it's a place that we're helped, it's a, pray that, it's a place that we have friendship, it's a place that we have supply where we supply one another's need. I mean, there's, there are so many functions of the church and yet what we can never lose sight of is the ultimate reason God put the church here. Because you will not always be part of this church. Right? When you die, it's over. Right? You're not going to be uh, part of it. Um, one day there will be one grand great assembly, which will be beautiful to be part of. But there is a function on earth to the church. And I'm referring to assembled bodies of believers united together. There's a purpose for it. God is strategic, extremely strategic. God's not making things up as he goes along. You know, God's not sitting up in heaven going, hmm, wonder what my plan will be tomorrow or for the next day. I mean, we know God knows the beginning from the, the end. And my individual life has a purpose, but God is united together with a church body. And um, there are things for our church to do, and there are roles for each person to play within the church. And <clears throat> I've said it often that the plan of God is not for anybody within the church to feel like they're um, uh, just a bystander or a spectator to what God is doing in, in the church. And I want to refresh, probably nothing I say today is going to be new or revolutionary to anybody, but it's necessary to, um, to lay, again, some really clear foundations um, for taking our church, as God is leading us, I guess you could say, to the next level. And I, I don't know if that's the right word for it. But it's, it's ensuring that we as a church body are fulfilling the purposes and the ministry that God has given to us. So I want you to go back to Matthew 16, 18, and just follow a couple of progressive thoughts in the Scripture. Matthew chapter 16, in verse number 18, um, one of the supposed laws of hermeneutics, how do you study the Bible? Um, and there's something called the law of first mention, which simply means you look the first time God introduces a subject and you follow it through the scriptures as it unfolds by God. And God reveals things progressively. He did not give Adam the whole Bible. Right? He did give Adam a little bit of his word, like, don't touch the tree, be fruitful and multiply. Right? So he did get a little bit of the word of God, but Adam did not have the writings of the New Testament, for example. God has chosen to reveal things progressively. And we are an extremely privileged generation to have the entire revelation of God, beginning to end, and we have the Holy Spirit of God to give us interpretation of the Scripture. So we're very privileged. So we get a chance now to look at any subject or any doctrine, and we can go back and see the first time that it was mentioned, and we can build progressively. A lot of false doctrines come because people study things maybe backwards. 
um, or they, they don't get the foundation of something and they start getting on level four and they misinterpret things. So how you study is very important. Matthew 16, 18. We'll start at verse 15. Matthew 16, we'll start at verse 15. And he said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. So this is a very important understanding that there are things that you cannot understand unless God the Father reveals it to you. Right? You, you can go to school for your whole life and you can have all kinds of degrees and there are things you will never figure out. There is a wisdom that comes down from above. It requires God to lighten the eyes and grant understanding. And that's why Proverbs 2 tells us that to get wisdom and understanding, we cry to God for that. Right? You can study. Anybody can open the Bible and you will be able to grab information that is true and right and correct out of the Bible and not be saved and not know the Lord. I mean, it's truth whether you're saved or lost. <clears throat> but there are things about God in the Scripture that you will remain blinded to unless God Himself opens your eyes. So don't, don't get too smart you know, thinking, wow, I'm such a smart person with a high level of intelligence. I've got this many degrees. I will explain the Bible to you. Right? They're extremely intelligent people who've come up with horrific and damnable heresies and, and doctrines. So the, to know who Christ is, that thou art the Christ. Christ is the Greek word for the Messiah. You are the Messiah. You are the, you are the, pro, you are the fulfillment of the promises. You are the virgin-born Son, you are um, all of those Old Testament prophecies, and you're also the Son of the living God. And then Jesus said, this was revealed to you by my Father. Verse 18, and I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock will I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So, of course, um, there's a pretty bad misinterpretation of what rock the church is built on. Um, our Catholic friends would say, Peter is the rock that the church is built on. Um, but Peter is not the rock that the church was built on. I've studied Peter's life, and uh, I don't want to be built on Peter's life. Peter was a great guy, a lot of zeal, a lot of energy, but from beginning to end, Peter was a little bit waffly. Um, lots of ups and downs, even post-Pentecost after being filled with the Spirit. The same Peter that preached to the first Gentiles and uh, revealed to the church at Jerusalem, God has opened the door to the Gentiles. The same Peter later on would be eating with Gentiles and some Jews would show up and he'd run out the back door to not let it known he'd be, you know what I'm saying? That's the same Peter. The, the church is not built on Peter. In fact, the name Peter, as you know, Peter was um, a name... Uh, given to him by Christ. Simon it was his name. Jesus named him Peter. And Peter is um, Petros. That's the Greek word Petros, which means a pebble. Um, a pebble. And when he said, Thou art Petros, Peter, Petros, a pebble, and upon this rock, the word rock there is Petra, I will build my church. And uh, a Petra, a rock, is, is not a boulder. It's not something big. It, it is a, a foundation stone that you would build, like when they check whether you can build your house, so and so. I mean, this is a rock that you could build a house on. And there's a big difference between that and a pebble. And the rock, of course, there is that revelation in verse number 16, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. God's church would be built on those people who had understood this truth that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, that he is the Son of God, and that on that profession of who he was, that he would build his church on that. Yes, Christ himself is the rock. It's the profession and faith in who Christ is, that, that, that his church would be built upon that. And then he said in Matthew 16, 18, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell 
shall not prevail against it. So as I've mentioned to you before, again, this is um, review, that right there in the very first mention, the very first time the concept, the word church is mentioned in the Bible, I know that later in Acts, Acts will call the Jews in the wilderness in that congregation church, but that was what it was revealed later in the book of Acts. But as far as the first mention of church, it's here, and it's, it's founding, it's builder, the builder is Christ, and it's purpose. And the purpose here is that the gates of hell would not prevail against it. So we know then, right from the first mention, that the church is in a battle. It's in a war. Right? So that, that concept has to come into your mind right from the beginning, that the church is in a war. Now, we're not in a war with people. Right? We're not in a... We're not in a crusade where we're picking up swords and spears and going to countries like ISIS and demanding people in. That's not where our war is. We, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, right? Over and over, we're not in a physical war, but we are going up against the gates of hell. That's where our battle is. We know that um, our enemy is Satan. We've already looked, for example, in, uh, in 2 Corinthians, it says that the God of this world has blinded the minds of them that believe not. Satan is the blinder of eyes, and he blinds their eyes lest the light of the gospel should shine in unto them. And the gospel is centered around who is Jesus Christ, right? You, this is eternal life that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. John 17, 3. Salvation is knowing Christ. Salvation is in a person. It is in Christ, not, not, in, a, not in a creed or anything else. It's in the person of Christ. Um, uh, the book of Acts says, Neither is there salvation in any other, and there is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. Salvation is in the name of Jesus Christ, the person of Jesus Christ, what Christ did on Christ on Calvary. And so Satan is against the gospel. He is against the message of the gospel. So Christ's church is built on that profession of who Christ is, and then it goes and carries that message, but in the way of us carrying that message is Satan and the gates of hell. So his gates are set up to blind people from the light of the gospel. It's to keep people in and to keep us out. And the Bible says that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Will not prevail. That means we win. And um, I said this to a group of young people when we were in, in Missouri. I said, do you understand the advantage that we, the believers, and Christ church have? Like we have, we have this advantage. You know in Romans 3 it says what advantage did the Jew have? over the Gentile, if everybody saved the same way, like what advantage was it then to be a Jew? And the answer was, well, because the Jews had the Word of God. That was their advantage over the Gentiles, is that the Gentiles had conscience and creation, so they could know there was a God, but the Jew had the oracles of God. So with the Word of God, they had an advantage, but they, they didn't use that advantage. They lost the advantage. And God said, I'm going to take the gospel away from you and give it to another nation that will bring forth uh, fruit And so God's given the advantage now to Gentiles and specifically to his churches. But we have a greater advantage than that because we not only have the word of God, right? We have more than that. We have the indwelling spirit of the living God. We have promises of God. Like, uh, and take this promise, for example. The Bible says if I submit myself unto God, I can resist the devil. And what does the devil do? He flees. So this is, this is I go into battle with these promises, and I have such an advantage over Satan. We have such an advantage over Satan. It's sad that we're not taking more ground with all the advantages that we, that we have. So those gates of hell aren't as strong as hell would like to think they are. We have an advantage over those gates. We prevail over those gates. Now, in verse number 19, And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So within the gates of hell are people. 
Like people are there. We're dealing with souls. We're dealing with people. And to the church that has made this profession that Christ will build, keys are given to it. And those keys are given to, to loosen or bind people. I want you to think of those keys for just a moment. And we have those keys. I believe those keys are the gospel. Because when we take this message of Christ and we preach the gospel, people know the truth and the truth sets them free. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.24 says that when we preach truth and God gives repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, people are set free of the devil who has taken them captive. So we have that power. Like we have the keys. Lost people don't have the keys. Like people who are lost and who are in the darkness, they don't have the key to set themselves free. The Son has to set them free, and they'll be free indeed. But the, it is the church that goes against those gates. Now look at Matthew 18. Matthew 18. <clears throat> so you think about we're going against the gates of hell, and gates typically have locks on them, and I've got the key to unlock the gate. Everywhere I go. It doesn't matter where we go in the world. Whatever gate Satan has set up, we have keys that can open up all of those gates everywhere we go. And it is a sad thing when we have the keys and we don't use them to unlock the, the door and to set people free. Looking at people in bondage, but we didn't take the gospel to them, we're basically keeping the keys um, back and not using them. Matthew 18, verse 15, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, Go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven." All right, so we've got another mention of church here. The first mention of church in the Bible tells us who built it, what's the profession that it's built on, and what its purpose is. And the second mention of church in the Bible is in the context of putting people out of the church. Wow. I mean, it went right to the founding of the church to discipline within the church very quickly. And so that tells me right here early on that God cares deeply about the composition of His church. God cares about the composition of the church. God cares about those people who are in His church. Uh, being part of God's church is something that you can be put out of, which means that it is not just a right for a believer to be part of a church. It is a privilege and it is a responsibility. Like being part of a church, it's a privilege and it's a responsibility, right? Because um, if you think about the church as a, as a unit that is going up against the gates of hell, right? You're, you're looking at it in a sense of warfare. You're looking at it as, as part of a, a military unit. And again, please, I'm using military reference only in the way we go up against Satan and the powers of darkness, not militant the way we go against human beings, Right? But you look at a military unit. Cohesion in that unit is important. And if there are disciplinary problems within any military unit, there are ways to deal with that. And ultimately, if the person being dealt with refuses to submit to that correction, they have to be put out of the unit. They, they're not put out of the unit because they're hated. They're not put out of the unit because there's no hope for them, they're put out of the unit because they themselves will not submit to the cohesion of that, of that body. And the, the church has to be a unified body as it, as it fulfills its mission. Because if we, if we really work to fulfill this mission and we're divided against each other, what's the Bible say about a house divided against itself? It'll fall. It can't stand. So unity within that body is important, and, it, and if there becomes a brother in the church who's trespassing against another brother, God says, don't ignore that. Like, you have to go address it. You have to go to that brother, and the best way to deal with that 
when you begin with it, is privately. I had no need to announce everything before everybody. You deal with it privately. Go to that brother one-on-one. -on -one. Rebuke him. You know, there is a time for you to be rebuked. Right? Nobody is above or beyond the need to be rebuked or corrected from time to time. You're going to need it. I'm going to need it. Welcome to the club. We're growing Christians. We're part of a body. Reprove, rebuke, exhort. It's all in the scripture. You need it. I need it. But oftentimes we're too proud to take rebuke or take correction. So here's somebody that's trespassed. They've obviously not seen or understood what they're doing. They've been rebuked by a brother and for whatever reason, hardened their heart, not dealt with it correctly, can't resolve it. So the Bible says, don't leave it. You got to progress with it now. So go get one or two other brothers, still keep the circle small, get a couple spiritual brothers and go to that person again and, and do your best to correct it, fix it. And ultimately, if it can't be resolved at that level, you still can't leave it. You still can't leave it. Then it says, tell it to the church. Right? Now that's 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 tough stuff. We're we're in a privacy generation. Actually, no, we're not. It's nothing private anymore. Now that's another a complete issue. But the idea is we don't just tell it to the church as a as a concept of, hey, wow, look what this person did. The church now has a responsibility because it says if he neglect to hear the church which means the collective job of the church body is then to plead with that brother. And only if he then refuses to hear the church, he has to be put out of the church. All right? He becomes to thee as a publican and a heathen. Now, we don't treat publicans bad. Jesus was kind to publicans. We don't treat heathens bad. Right? This doesn't mean you put someone out of the church and in, in, in this church discipline, and now that they're out, we see them in town and we, we turn the other way. It's not a, it's, it is a discipline. It just means that you, it, um, a dishonorable discharge is what it is. If the military has to put someone out of the unit, it is a dishonorable discharge. Right? We can still know you. We can still like you. You cannot be part of the unit. You can't because there's not a cohesion with the unit. Right? Your presence within the unit is causing division and causing discord. And if your presence within the unit causes division and discord, you hurt the unit's ability for the warfare that it is engaged with. Right? That's why God says, and by the way, God takes it two levels. Not only if they've trespassed, if, if you've trespassed, if, if you get to the altar and you remember, man, I've got ought against my brother. God says, I don't want your gift. I want resolution because the unit, the body, the church has to function in such a way. So think of the first two mentions now of church. The first mention of church gives us our founding and our mission, like our founding by Christ on the confession of who Christ is and our mission, which is to go up against the gates of hell. The second time the church is mentioned in the Bible, it deals with the relationship of the people within that body, their sin and their relationship. Because we have to proceed together as a, as a single unit, right? We have to care for each other within the body. Uh, th this body is a self-governing. We govern within ourselves. We're not governed from without. And the governing from within, there's got to be holiness. God doesn't want sin in the church. If there's a trespass in the church, we have to deal with it. And there's balance to all this because people who are newly saved, who've newly come to the Lord... There's no way you can expect them to have like a, a life of, of holiness yet. But what everyone has to be in is in the process. There can never be a time within the church where we just say, you know what, we're just going to tolerate this particular sin because we love this brother and we don't want to be a discouragement to him or this sister or to her. We can't do that. Like it has to be a holy church. Ephesians will talk about the church as being without spot, without blemish, being pure, being sanctified, being washed, all right? Because we can't let sin in the camp. Study the Bible, go back to Israel, Old Testament, New Testament, when sin is tolerated within the camp, right? Power, the power of God is withdrawn from that. He is a holy God, wants holiness in the church. 
So you don't get to charge ahead against the gates of hell with a, with a load of sin in your life, and somehow God will see how dedicated you are to serving God so he doesn't care about the load of sin that you're carrying. That's not God. He has a church with a commission, and he has a church that must be pure, that must be unified, must be self-governed within it. Now go to Acts 2, 47. Acts 2, 47. Now, church is implied more, but this is the third actual mention of church in the Bible, Acts 2.47. It says, Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. So, now, the third time the church is mentioned, God said that it is having people added to it daily added daily all right so the the church is not an exclusive club for a group of people who like each other all right and this is what church has become church has quickly become an exclusive club of people who like each other and then it stops going against the gates of hell and the idea is that as we do the mission going against the gates of hell that people are being added to the church daily Right? Our generation, I mean, for some churches it's annually, a few people, sometimes it's monthly, it's, it's not a lot. And sometimes we, we try to blame the reasons that the church is not having people added to it. Um, culture, communism, modernism, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. I can tell you there is one basic reason that people aren't added to the church daily is because the people who have the keys to the kingdom aren't unlocking the gate. Like the preaching of the gospel is not happening vigorously and regularly amongst God's people. Right? So we see here that God starts off telling us what the church is, who its builder is, what its mission is, and then it tells us there's got to be regulation within that body, has to have unity, there has to be cohesion within the body, and then we find out that when the body operates the right way, that people are being added to that church daily. This is, this is our God, this is our command. Um, and then, of course, I don't have to go through the book of Acts because you'll find out quickly in Acts 8 they were persecuted, right? Persecution came against the church. Um, that's normal. In Acts 8, there was a great persecution that was against the church. Why would there be a persecution against the church? Well, you go up against the gates of hell, and the keepers of the gates of hell aren't happy. Right? You go into Satan's domain, and you start setting captives free, and he's never happy about that. Right? So Satan is an, is an opposer. Um, to me, and I think biblically, where there is not much persecution against the church, it's because there's nothing really to persecute, because Satan is pretty happy the way that you are. And so it's, when, when you think about this, it's important for churches to have balance. The internal working of the body amongst itself and the outward mission of the church. Sometimes you can get churches who are very focused on the outward mission, and yet within there's, there's division, fracture, unholiness, right? So it will eventually collapse from within. All right? And then you have churches who can be overly focused with the body and the people within, and they walk around with magnifying glasses into everybody's life, and they're consumed within each person in the body, and there's no mission happening outward both of those balances can get out of uh, they can get out of whack but the people that were persecuted in Acts chapter number eight uh, the persecution that arose about Stephen it says they were scattered and they went everywhere preaching and by the time you get to Acts chapter 9 there's not just one church anymore there are churches it's the first time churches plural are mentioned in Acts chapter 9 because we no longer just have one church in Jerusalem because the people have scattered abroad and the concept of a church the word church ecclesia uh, an ecclesia is always an assembled body 
in whatever way that it's used. It's an assembly, it's a body, it's joined together. So as they were spread abroad into Samaria and Judea, the people who were getting saved in Judea could not assemble with the people in Jerusalem because a church is an assembly, it's a body of people put together. They made new units. And so in Judea, the people who got saved there formed churches. Those in Samaria formed churches. Those in Antioch, there was a church that was formed. The missionary journey, they leave Antioch and they go out to all these various places. And as Paul evangelizes with his team, what's left behind in there are churches. All right. So my, my point is that when you look at the Bible, we get a picture of what churches are. And there has to be a balance um, in those things. Um, now, I want you to go now to Romans uh, 12. Is it time? Something else that is very clearly taught throughout the Bible, we've, we've taught it, we've talked about it, um, is that within the church that is his body, there are ways in which God is going to use each person within the body. And he's not going to use everybody exactly the same. Just, just like in a military unit. If you've, if you've got a military unit, everyone has a specialty. Right? Everybody has a specialty. Someone's in communication. Right? What are the different? All the transportation. I don't know. There's all kinds of, even if you get into your squad, everybody within that squad has got specialties. And the same way within the church, within the body of the church, and God uses the concept of body many times. In 1 Corinthians 12, he outlines it because the church at Corinth was a disaster because there was... There was all kinds of inward conflict and jealousy within the church because everybody wanted what the other guy had and was, was doing. And so God teaches us clearly that within the church there will be, God will equip and gift people differently, all still for the furtherance of the gospel and for the completion of the, of the mission. Yet you won't all do the same thing. I won't do all the same thing. God will gift the church and it's very important for you to know your gifting. And I don't think what you read in Romans 12 is, is, a, is, an, is, is like a complete idea. These are the only ways God gifts people within the church. I think God is unique and crafty and special in, in many ways. And for whatever task is at hand, God's spirit within the body will divide up amongst the people the gifts necessary for the mission that is at hand. And times change. Things are, are different. I mean, you go back 100 years ago, you, we did not need people that could um, use media. Media was not a part of a church's outreach and ministry. It is today, right? And so how we do it and the, the gifting to do it, it's very important. But in Romans 12, verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. All right, so these are verses we've, we've milked a million times over. But ultimately, at the end of these verses... God wants to speak to you about His will. Right? God's will. God's will for you. Right? You're not just... You are a volunteer. We all enter this thing voluntarily with our, with our hearts. But once we volunteer, we then present our bodies to God. That's the voluntary part. I present my body to God. And once I've said, God, I am at your disposal. I am at your service. I am here to do whatever you want me to do. Giving my body, there's then a process. And the process is here. You need to be transformed. 
Just like a soldier goes to boot camp, you're not ready for frontline battle yet. You got to go to boot camp. There has to be a breaking down of your own will, your own ways, your own thinking. You have to be retrained. You have to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Only when you've gone through that process of the renewing of your mind are you in a position for God to give you your assignment. Like, what is my will for you? What do I want you to accomplish? Because if God gives you an assignment, but you have the wrong mindset, the wrong ideology, the wrong thinking in your mind, you will mess it up. You won't do it right, right? Your ways and God's ways, my ways and God's ways, they're not the same. So God has to take me through a process of transforming so I don't enter God's work my way. It's got to be God's way. So if you will follow Romans 12, 1 and 2, God will do things to you that will lead you down a path where God will begin to clarify this is my will for you. But that will, by the way, is in the context of the body. It's in the context of the church. And I'll show you here in just a moment that when God begins to show you his will, what he wants you to do, you're not Rambo. You, you don't suddenly say, hey, God has shown me his will for my life. I'm out on my own to do my own thing. No, it's always still going to be in the context of the body. You're a communications expert. You're in intelligence. You're a gunner. You're, I don't know. But God will tell you your function within the body. And there's a warning. There's a, there's a very strong warning that comes next after God has taken you through the process and begun to show his will to you. Look at the warning in verse three. For I say, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. So as God begins to transform you, your mind, your thinking, your heart, your ways, and God begins to delegate clearly to you your function, his will, there's then a warning, keep your head deflated and low. Because now... What you are going to do and what you are going to become is because I will deal to you the measure of faith. I'm going to give to you what is required to do the will that I'm going to give you. Uh, you may get a smarter brain because when God gifts you, he's going to give you things that you don't have naturally. That's why it's called a gift. This is not just your natural ability. You know, many times when you think about your natural ability, you think, man, I'm going to offer my natural ability to God, and God is going to be so impressed with my natural abilities, he's going to use it. Paul said, those things that were gained to me, I counted loss for Christ. Your natural abilities, the things that you are naturally good at, will puff you up. They will give you pride, and you will think you are a gift to God. And you're not a gift to God. God is a gift to you. So as God transforms you, and as God delegates something in his will to you, God is going to give you things. There are, there are new things that you're going to do because of the gifting that God gave you. And he said, when you get those things, be careful that you don't start thinking more highly of yourself than you are. This is a danger in any church. Because there are people whom God has gifted certain ways, and they look down on other people in the church that aren't kind of up where they are. And you're, now your gifting, and now your abilities that God has given to you, could become a new source of division within the church. And remember, the gifting, you have to remember that the gifting that God gave you was that. A gifting. And secondly... Not everyone is going to have the same gifting. So when God does give you a particular gifting, the gifting will probably come with a passion for a particular thing, as you'll see outlined in here. The thing that God gifts you to do, that he shows his will to you to do, he'll give you a heart for that particular thing. And you will love it, you will desire it, you will be good at it, but remember, God doesn't give the same gifting to everybody else. So because someone is not passionate and gifted and giving themselves to the same particular thing that you are doesn't make them less 
than you. It just means God has a different function within the body for them. So, you know, we look at Romans 12, 1 and 2, and we get so excited when God finally shows his will to us, but you've got to be careful that that doesn't become now a source of your pride. Verse 4, why? For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. Now, that word office there um, is not the same office when the Bible talks about office of a pastor, office of a deacon. It's a completely different word. The word office there means the function, the practice, the deed, the work. In fact, that word is most often translated um, deed. Matthew 16, 27 says, we'll all be rewarded according to our works. That's the same word for office here. So think of this. You are going to be judged and rewarded according to your office. Judged according to your work. Judged according to your office. Not everyone, not every member in one body has the same office. Not everyone has the same work. Not everyone has the same deed. So if, for example, I was part of a military unit and I was given an office, I was given a task, I was given a responsibility, if I look at my task and my responsibility and I neglect it, I let it down, but because I really want to do what the other guys over here are doing. So I jump over with these other guys, and I, I do their task better than they do. Am I, when I get to my superiors, are they going to say, wow, I am so glad you dropped the ball on your task and ran over to the assignment that was not yours and helped them out. We've got a purple heart for you. No. Nope. You see, God is extremely specific. And God himself will choose what he divides to you. 1 Corinthians 12, I know the context is prophecy, tongues, knowledge, miracles, uh, particular gifts that were temporary that are not in operation today, but the same principle applied that the Spirit of God chose himself to divide within the body as he will, and your job was in essence to stay in your lane. Understand the gifting, understand the office that God has given to you because the judgment that you're going to receive, you're not going to say to God, Lord, I know this was the office. This was the, the task you delegated to me, but I didn't really like it. I really liked this thing. So what I did, Lord, I gave this thing my best and I was fruitful over here. The Lord's not going to reward you for that. You are not going to be rewarded for that. And of course, the rewards is a whole other section, you know, on, on this particular um, concept. I must understand how God has gifted me, what has been delegated to me, and when I know that, I have to be careful not to be high-minded about it. I've got to recognize that this was a gifting, this was a delegation, this is of God, and then I am to labor, I am to give myself into that task that God has given to me. Okay, we're at 11, we're going to pause, and I think we'll just continue with this, because um, I barely started. Thank you, Father, for this morning. And thank you, Lord, for these scriptures. And Lord, I pray for myself and for every person who is part of this church family, this church body, that we would not neglect the gift given to us. That we would present our bodies to you. That we would allow the transformation to take place. 
that we could hear from you what's been delegated to us and that we would give our life to the office, the gifting. I pray that there would be unity in the church and as a result of this, we pray and ask God that we would be successful against the gates of hell. Uh, Lord, as we break for a few moments, bless our fellowship and prepare our hearts uh, to continue on. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, take a 10-minute break, and then we'll just we'll continue with this in the morning.